Knowledge Products presents The Giants of Philosophy, Immanuel Kant, narrated by Charlton Heston. Part 1. In July 1789, the political and social crises of France's ancien regime heated up and then exploded. The fiery years that followed are known to history as the French Revolution. Its center was Paris, capital city of France, and unofficial capital of European society and culture. The upheavals in Paris in the summer of 1789 heralded a generation of conflict and social turmoil throughout Europe. It also heralded the emergence of what would grow into a new social order. The birth pangs of our modern world have been described by the great French historian Albert Soboul, writing of the events of July 13th and 14th, 1789. Rioting broke out again on the night of the 13th. Bands of men roamed around Paris, hunting for arms and threatening to ransack the townhouses of the aristocracy. Trenches were dug and barricades thrown up. From dawn on the 14th, the iron workers of the capital were making pikes. But it was not pikes, but firearms that were needed. On July 14th, the crowd demanded that the citizenry of Paris be supplied with arms. With the aim of seizing them for themselves, they attacked the Invalides, where they took possession of 32,000 firearms, and from there proceeded to the Bastille. The fortress prison of the Bastille was well defended against a street mob. But when the city's middle-class militia joined the rioters with five cannon, the Bastille's governor lowered the drawbridge and surrendered. The people's revolution had begun. Soon, King Louis XVI would be forced to return to Paris from his palace at Versailles, 20 miles away. The recently convened National Assembly would fall increasingly under the influence of its most radical members. Peaceful revolution would become violent. Within a decade, the conflagration that had been ignited in France would spread war and social upheaval across the European continent. The great revolution that had been unleashed in Paris would shatter the old order of Europe. Eighteen years later, soldiers of the revolution under Napoleon would occupy the small provincial city of Königsberg in distant East Prussia. They briefly closed the city's modest university. Few of Napoleon's soldiers visited the grave of the city's most distinguished former citizen, only three years dead, the philosopher Immanuel Kant. It had taken 18 years for the soldiers of the revolution to reach the eastern limits of Europe, but the ideas that drove them had come sooner. Ideas that had found in Professor Kant not only a champion, but a mind of genius that would transform and extend them in both time and space. It was said that Napoleon's troopers carried the revolution in their knapsacks, but Kant gave the revolution the voice of reason and the wings of thought. As he wrote late in his life, The revolution which we see taking place in our own times may succeed or it may fail. It may be so filled with misery and atrocities that no right-thinking man would ever decide to make the same experiment again at such a price, even if he could hope to carry it out successfully at the second attempt. But I maintain that the revolution has aroused in the hearts and desires of all spectators who are not themselves caught up in it a sympathy which borders almost on enthusiasm, although the very utterance of this sympathy is fraught with danger. It cannot have been caused by anything other than a moral disposition within the human race. Kant's philosophy describes this moral disposition within us all. While armies fought, Kant thought and wrote. And even though the French Revolution wrought vast changes in social and political life, Kant's work may have been as important in transforming how we think and feel. This transformation would be deeper and more lasting than the astonishing changes of ruling dynasties and political borders that so alarmed and thrilled Kant's contemporaries. The storming of the Bastille demolished the political power of the old order in France and gave rise to a generation of war. The fighting would spread to the remote corners of Europe, 
to the dusty plains of India. It would spread also to the quiet forests of the American frontier in what Americans called the War of 1812. In the world of thought, the beginning of this global revolution was marked much more quietly. In 1781, Kant published the first edition of his book, Critique of Pure Reason. Its direct legacy was not bloody combat, but a new way of seeing human nature and the powers of the intellect. This intellectual revolution would transform and stimulate modern science and give powerful impetus to the modern idea of human rights and the dignity of man. Kant wanted to show us how to see great artists as heroes of the human spirit and how to value self-reliant individuality as the most precious quality of our humanity. He believed that science and religion can coexist, but that no form of political tyranny can have a genuinely rational justification. The dramatic events of July 14, 1789 in Paris are even believed by some to pale against the less vivid but perhaps more significant work of the unassuming philosopher of Königsberg. <laughs> Outwardly, Kant led an uneventful life. He was born in the easternmost province of the German kingdom of Prussia in the spring of 1724. East Prussia, settled by German farmers in the late Middle Ages, was an outpost of German civilization. Led by the crusading order of the Teutonic Knights, Germans had conquered this region from its previous Slavic inhabitants and held it against the neighboring kingdoms of Poland, Russia, and Sweden. The fortress castles of the Teutonic Order still dotted the East Prussian countryside in Kant's day. The ruling Hohenzollern princes of East Prussia were descended from the last Grand Master of the Teutonic Order. In the century before Kant's birth, they had acquired other German territories. These lands stretched from the Rhine Valley in the distant west to the central province of Brandenburg, centered around the city of Berlin, to East Prussia. Under a series of energetic rulers, this collection of provinces became a unified state with its capital at Berlin. It took its name, Prussia, from Kant's home province. In Kant's lifetime, Prussia became a European power, a leading state in the loose-knit German confederation known as the Holy Roman Empire. Prussia also became an important factor in continental politics. It has been said of the decrepit Holy Roman Empire that it was neither holy, Roman, nor an empire but the kingdom of Prussia was both ambitious and powerful. In the 75 years after Kant's death, its rulers would create a second German empire. Prussia succeeded by imposing hard discipline on its people. This permitted its rulers to raise and support a great army despite the small size of the kingdom and its limited resources. Its enemies described Prussia as an army with provinces. The militarized discipline of this small but powerful state formed the social and political background of Kant's career. Kant was the fourth child of a master saddler, Johann Jörg Kant. His origins hardly pointed towards a professional career as a university professor. Social mobility in Prussia was highly restricted. Kant's successful career was due first to the determined influence of his religiously devout mother, who imagined that her son might become a pastor. Second, Kant was stimulated by teachers who advanced a promising pupil. Third, but most of all, Kant had his own fierce drive. Although he would grow into an outwardly mild-tempered professional man, inwardly he possessed a militantly independent spirit. A single phrase from Kant illustrates this attitude of independence. He once described the early years of human life as a time of child slavery, though by all accounts his own childhood was in no way unusual or severe. The natural dependency of children, which most people take for granted, offended Kant's free spirit. Kant would share with his younger contemporary Thomas Jefferson a lifelong opposition to every form of tyranny over the mind of man. Kant believed that the yearning for freedom is unquenchable. Even without the mind of a seer, I now maintain that I can predict from the aspects and signs of our times that the human race will achieve a free republican constitution and that it will henceforth progressively improve without any more total reversals. For a phenomenon of this kind which has taken place in human history can never be forgotten. 
since it has revealed in human nature an aptitude and power for improvement which no politician could have sought up. Only nature and freedom combined within mankind have enabled us to forecast it. This belief in the innate freedom of the human soul would animate Kant's entire philosophy. Kant's career followed the ordinary path for an academic in 18th century Germany. After completing his university training, he served for seven years as a private tutor until he was 31. In 1755, he won appointment as a magister at the University of Königsberg, which permitted him to offer lectures in return for student fees. For 15 years, Kant patiently waited for a professorial appointment at Königsberg. This long-awaited opportunity to be a professor came in 1770 at age 46. As his fame grew, Kant turned down several offers of positions at more prestigious universities. He told his friend Marcus Hertz that he preferred stable and familiar surroundings. Private gain and public applause are no incentive to me. All change frightens me. I am content with a peaceful situation exactly suited to my needs, in which work, speculation, and social contacts alternate with one another, and my very easily affected but otherwise carefree spirit, and my still more moody, though never sick body, are kept busy without being overexerted. Even before his appointment as professor, Kant was a popular and deeply respected teacher. His longtime student and biographer, Reinhold Jachmann, described his teaching. He never read his lectures. During many periods, he never even made use of a notebook, but had a few jottings in the margins of his textbooks, which served him as a guide. He frequently brought no more than a tiny slip of paper into the lecture with him, on which he had outlined his ideas in a small, abbreviated hand. Unlike many professors of the time, Kant had a distaste for pure instruction. One student wrote, He was heartily averse to all uncritical repetition. Think for yourselves. Inquire for yourselves. Stand on your own feet, the expressions he was always using. He took pleasure in clarifying his students' uncertainties or explaining doubtful points in greater detail. His lectures frequently became open discussions, spiced with wit and good humor. Yachmann reports that when Kant lectured, he often seemed simply to think aloud with great clarity. Even his teaching of metaphysics was lucid and attractive. Kant had a particularly skillful method of asserting and defining metaphysical concepts which consisted to all appearances in carrying out his inquiries in front of his audience as though he himself had just begun to consider the question. The philosopher Herder, who studied with Kant in the 1760s, later wrote that he was a spirited man throughout his life. Though in the prime of life, Kant still had the joyful high spirits of a young man, which he kept, I believe, into extreme old age. His open brow was the seat of indestructible serenity and gladness. A wealth of ideas issued from his lips. Jest and wit and good humor were at his bidding. He was never indifferent to anything worth knowing. He encouraged and gently compelled people to think for themselves. Despotism was alien to his nature. Kant's physical stature was slight. He stood barely five feet tall and was very thin. His friends described him as almost frail, though he was, in fact, rarely ill. The son of his colleague, Professor Reusch, described Professor Kant. He was always soberly dressed and his deeply serious face, his head sunken slightly to one side, and his steady but not too slow step attracted respectful attention whenever he appeared. 
The light sand color of his clothing, later replaced by dark brown, was unobtrusive. On warm days, as was then the custom, he used to take off his hat and carry it on the gold knob of his cane, leaving his head adorned only by his finely powdered wig. Kant remained a bachelor all his life. He left no record of a lost love. However, in his old age, Kant explained this situation with his characteristic wit. When I could have done with a wife, I wasn't in a position to support one. And when I was in a position to support one, I had no further use for one. In later life, Kant showed a clear preference for male company, and he dominated polite society in Königsberg. Jachmann, who became the government official in charge of the local schools, reports on Kant's social skills. Kant possessed the great art of conversing in an interesting manner on any topic in the world. His wide learning provided him with a wealth of conversational material, which his original mind, with its own way of looking at everything, invested with a new and characteristic form. In large gatherings, even of scholars, Kant avoided all discussion of academic subjects. Least of all was he ever heard to engage in argumentation on the topics of his philosophy. I do not remember him ever having mentioned one of his own works in company, or having referred to their contents. He liked lively, quick-witted, talkative companions. Good taste and gaiety prevailed in any company where Kant was present. This physically small, mild-tempered, but deep-thinking man lived out his life in the provincial backwater of Königsberg. Nonetheless, he was, perhaps, the greatest intellect in an age of genius. The admiration and even reverence of his students would, after 1781, spread across Germany. Kant's profound book, Critique of Pure Reason, won acclaim as the most important philosophical treatise of its time. Within a decade of its publication, his critical philosophy, as Kant called his system, became the dominant philosophical orientation in Germany. In succeeding years, Kant's philosophy expanded its influence to France, England, and beyond. Within a generation, he would be regarded even by his philosophical opponents as the most significant modern thinker since the French philosopher and mathematician René Descartes, who wrote nearly two centuries before him. This is the end of Part 1. Please download Part 2 to continue.